Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Now some people still insist, it's hard to imagine this goes on, that high fat diets are okay and they're not harmful. Um, and actually if more effective for weight loss and on and on and on. But according to a recent study, just one high fat meal can be damaging to health. So it's kind of interesting the way that this was all done. Dutch researchers measured the metabolic effects of giving a high fat milkshake to two groups of men. The first group was 10 healthy volunteers, while the other group was made up of nine men who had metabolic syndrome, and then they also had one or more risk factors for heart disease, things like high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and abdominal fat. The healthy volunteers actually were told to start eating a lot of higher fat foods, about 1,300 calories extra per day. Um, and then blood tests were taken for the healthy men at the beginning of the study and after the four-week diet. And then blood test, tests were taken for both groups of men before and after they consumed this high-fat, high-calorie milkshake. Um, measurements were taken for 61 different bio biomarkers, including cholesterol and blood sugar. Both groups had worsened health after consuming the milkshake. So for the guys who had metabolic syndrome, sugar metabolism, fat metabolism, and inflammation were worse. The 10 healthy men showed signaling uh, changes in signaling molecules such as the hormones that regulate blood sugar, uh, fat metabolism, and inflammation after they had the milkshake. Uh, the researchers reported that the negative effects indicated the beginning of the development of metabolic disease in these men, and uh, this was before their blood tests actually showed changes in these markers, but it showed that, boy, if you kept doing this, you probably could eat your way into diabetes or metabolic syndrome. So the bottom line is that not only is a high fat diet not advisable, just one high fat meal can do some damage and have a negative effect on health. The problem is that the subtle effects of declining health um, are, um, are, are not necessarily apparent to the person who's eating the terrible diet, which allows them to practice bad habits for a really long time before something bad happens, uh, but bad, bad happens to them. And so, um, you know, we have to keep reminding people about this so that they don't wait for catastrophe to happen. You know, when people come here to Wellness Farm Health and they've had a stroke or a heart attack or something really serious is going on, boy, they're paying attention to their health. Now what we have to do is we have to back up the process and get to people who haven't had something catastrophic happen and get those people to do something about their health so that they can avoid that. So um, one, uh, one unhealthy meal and already your body starts making adjustments, leading you down the path of metabolic disease. All right, and then uh, my favorite federal agency to pick on, actually my second favorite, my favorite federal agency to pick on is USDA. My second favorite is FDA. And uh, today's topic has to do with FDA approval for a drug, which some people still think uh, means that it's safe and effective and that rigorous clinical trials have been conducted and the risks and the benefits of the drug have been carefully evaluated. I mean, a lot of doctors believe this. I was speaking with a member the other day um, who was talking to her doctor about the inadvisability of some drugs that she had been told to take. And, and um, he, very kind of fussy with her, said, uh, well, these are FDA-approved drugs, and if they were unsafe as you would say they are, they wouldn't be on the market. Well, I beg to differ, because research shows that the FDA is granting almost all applications for drug approvals right now. So the story behind this is a company called Biomed Tracker did an analysis of FDA drug approvals at the request of Forbes magazine. Now, I find it noteworthy that Forbes is interested in pursuing something like this because this is a publication that has really been friendly to the pharmaceutical industry, um, talking about all the life-saving things they do and the investment they make in our research and development, etc. So the fact that Forbes is starting to turn on them a little bit is uh, kind of exciting, actually, to me. Okay, so what Biomed Tracker normally does is track approvals of drugs um, and even approvals to take an existing drug and use it for a new purpose because investors want to know this stuff. It tells them uh, what they should be investing in. This year, 2015, the FDA has only rejected three drugs and approved 25. So that means that the approval rate is at 89%, but it's actually worse than that because if you do a little more analysis, which Biomed Tracker actually did, 
um, the rate is higher. And here's the reason why. One antibiotic was rejected for hospital-acquired pneumonia, for example, but it was approved for two other uses. And a drug called Jardiance, which you have Jardiance, which you have probably seen on TV for diabetes, was rejected for use in combination with metformin, but was approved for use on its own. So when you factor in these data, the approval rate's about 96% for new drugs. Biomed Tracker's data going back to 2008 shows that approval rates have been steadily going up. So in 2008, the approval rate was 50%. By 2011, it was 86%. And that was partly due to the fact that a bunch of drugs that had been rejected before ended up being approved. And then um, in 2014, the approval rate hit 88%, this year 96%. I mean, the drug companies have to be delighted about this. I mean, maybe at some point in time, they won't even have to ask for approval. They can just send a letter to the FDA and say, uh, we're not running any clinical trials. We don't want any hearings. We're just going to start selling this new drug, and we thought we'd let you all know. I mean, I know I'm being sarcastic, but how much, um, how much more can the FDA do to cater to drug companies? Now, the new analysis that was uh, specifically asked for by Forbes reported not only every time a drug was approved, um, uh, a new drug was approved, but also every time a drug was approved for an additional use. And so um, it followed the same trend, including data on expanded uses for drugs resulted in uh, 2006, 134 approvals with 56% approved. 2010, it went up to 70%. 2014, 77%. This year, 88%. In other words, 9 out of 10 times on average when the drug company asks the FDA for permission to do something, the FDA says, okay. Now, the FDA was asked why approvals were so high. And I just, this blows my mind. The FDA says one of the reasons is that it asks patients and their advocates what they want, and sick people often prefer that the FDA approve marginal drugs. Well, gosh, that's a good reason to do it. Now, it is true, and I've talked about this a lot over the last few years, representatives of groups attend committee meetings and hearings during which drugs, tests, and devices are often discussed, and people make emotional pleas for approvals. Almost all of these advocacy groups are funded by drug companies because the drug companies know that citizens have a lot of um, uh, emotional appeal in terms of getting committees to do the drug companies' bidding. It's hard to believe that members of review com committees aren't aware of this, so you must just be ignoring it. But um, I think, you know, call me crazy, the review process should be based on science, but instead it's become a social event populated by celebrities and patients who don't add anything to the scientific discussion and only serve to pressure committees to do what the drug companies want. Direct drug company influence is also a factor. I mean, a lot of these review committee members work for one or more drug companies, and it's a clear conflict of interest. Um, it's not going to change anytime soon, and I'm shocked to read that a bill pending in Congress endeavors to speed up, up approvals with even less procedural red tape. I mean, how much easier can they make it? There's almost no scrutiny now. Now, my proposal, my ultimate proposal, get rid of the FDA and start again. That's probably not practical, but I think there are some things that could be done that would make things better. The FDA should be split into two agencies. I've written extensively about this, one that handles drug approvals, the other handling um, drug regulation. There's an institutional conflict of interest where one branch of the FDA, the one, one department of FDA is approving a drug and then somebody else is saying we should take it off the market. If that was another agency across town, perhaps there would be more willingness to do it because admitting you're wrong is not easy for anybody, including FDA officials, to do. Uh, more stringent requirements for clinical trials. Some of these approvals should never be made, but even some of them that are should be much more contingent upon additional studies. Um, committee members should have no financial ties to any drug uh, makers at all. Committee meetings should be open to the public However, the dialogue, the testimony, the discussion should be limited to scientists who bring research and scientific understanding to the table. And it's not everything that needs to be done, but my gosh, we could clean up a lot of what's, um, what's wrong if we just did those things. All right, that's all for today. As usual, have a great rest of the week. Pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you next week with more news.